Hello. So we've covered the basic idea of convolution. And we have an equation that will implement convolution. That looks like this. This is something we can actually, given h and given x, we can compute it. We usually don't want to do so by hand. So if you're using MATLAB, you can use the COND command to compute that. Let's talk a little bit about the complexity, though. So if h is of length l and x is uh, length m, then how long will be the output? Well, first off, we can remember that for every value of x, we are adding um, the whole version of l. So for example, if x is, I'm sorry, the whole length of h. So if h is length 3, like so on. And over here we have x. When we convolve them, we will get a um, the first one will, in a sense, think of it as ringing a bell. It will ring the bell, and that bell will ring. Now when we hit it the second time, it continues to ring. for the duration of however long that bell rings. And so this goes on. The more samples we have, of course, the more versions that we get. And they all overlap each other. But whenever we finish, we are going to get m minus 1 more samples coming out. So the length y of n is of length m, the length of our input, plus l minus 1 as h continues to ring out. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. OK, so next, let's look at the complexity. of computing all of those samples. So how does this work? Well, in general, uh, computing all of uh, y of n is going to involve all the multiplications above and all the additions. How many multiplications? Well, there are going to be, in essence, we are going to be multiplying x of k times the entire sequence h. And we're going to be doing that m times. So there'll be m different x's that we're going to be multiplying, and each one is going to multiply every sample of h. So we have m plus or m times l multiplies to compute that output. Okay, so let's look to some examples and put some real numbers to this and see what we come up with. Um, if we have say, some CD quality audio. I have an old CD player that had a really nice feature. It was kind of a clever thing, and they were in all the, the uh, systems. 
sold about uh, 20 to 30 years ago. Have a selection. I can select it to uh, emulate different environments. So I put in my CD and if I want it to sound like I'm listening in a concert hall where we have some reverberation, I hit concert hall and it adds the echo and reverberation. It's uh, something of dubious um, benefit, but it's kind of fun. How does it do that? Well, actually, they're using some tricks, but the basic idea is that you find the impulse response of the concert hall and you can evolve your music with the concert hall. So let's say then that we uh, have CD audio. There's 44,100 samples per second per channel. And we want to add some reverberation. We recorded ourselves singing in the shower. And now we want to see what it sounds like if we had actually been singing in a cathedral. So suppose L is equal to 2500. That's our filter length. Then each sample is going to require uh, 2500 multiplies. Okay. And there are 44,100 um, samples per second per channel. So for one second, of output audio, we have 44,100 times 2,500 multiplies times 2, and that comes out to a huge number, 22, or 220, rather, million, 500,000, multiplies per second. Okay. Is that possible? Yeah, sure. That works. If I have, say, uh, an i7, and each core has several floating point units so I can keep busy, and I've got four cores, and the thing is running at a few gigahertz. Yep, I can do that. But that's an awful lot of computation to keep up with real time, and it's certainly not something that was thrown into a CD player back in the 1990s. So how did they do that? Well, um, actually, Let's go ahead and talk about that now. How could our ancestors have done this? Well, there are several ways, and we'll talk about this more later. This is kind of, uh, if you will, extra, instead of having a single system, H, we could implement several systems, H1 and H2, and tack them together. Okay, so what do each of these look like? Well, H1 would look something like this at uh, uh, 
times zero, it would have an output, and then a whole bunch of nothing. And then maybe another output, maybe that one goes negative, doesn't matter. More nothings for a very long time, and maybe a little small something positive. Okay, so this takes three multiplies to implement H1. Okay, now what does H2 look like? Well, H2 is going to be much shorter. And H2 is going to look something like plus 1, minus, it's going to be decaying. So if you remember, you can do something like this with an, a simple IIR filter. It would take almost nothing, but we're going to ignore um, the IAR case, and we're just going to do it as an FIR filter, because um, just to illustrate this, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Everything else is zero. So this is uh, H two of n, and it takes seven multiplies. Okay. So now we filter our signal through H1 first, and then through H2. What do we get? We get something that looks like this. The first sample out. Sorry, there we go. Will ring one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like that. And we'll get a bunch of zeros. And then it'll hit the next one. And it will ring seven times. And then finally, we get the last one and does the same thing. So now we have something that's really long and it behaves a lot like you would expect an actual echo to behave. That is, you have the sound hitting one wall and bouncing back, but on the way back it also bounces off other walls and so we get the initial return and then some delayed returns. The sound also goes and hits a a wall further away bounces back and we get the initial return and some delayed returns and then it goes and hits the furthest wall away initial return and some delayed returns and we can make this more complex by adding more filters in here and to get it to be really rich in its sound but for all of this we have 21 Multiply. So that was kind of a, a clever way to do these long reverberation times that my old CD player did that I bought back in 1994. Well, let's talk about, before we go on, another way of, before we quit, I guess, another way of doing um, implementation of convolution. And this is going to be uh, something we call block convolution. Right now, doing block convolution isn't going to look to be very special, uh, but it will set up for uh, later types of operation when we, well, I'll tell you what's coming, when we find that we can actually use the fast Fourier transform to speed up convolution. And we use the fast Fourier transform um, on blocks of data. So let's assume we have some signal x of n. Uh, 
and it's a nice long signal. So we can divide this into chunks. Usually of equal length, although there's nothing that says it has to be. Some algorithms will require it though. And we're going to label each chunk x1, x2, and so on and so forth. Okay, so now we can write our original signal xn as a sum of these chunks. First, I guess I should define the length of one of these chunks as capital N. So this definition, we will sum over R, x sub R, so that's 1, 2, and so on and so forth, depending on how we end up doing it, N. But we have to, if we're not careful, they'll all pop on top of each other. So we have to uh, take into account that each one is shifted by N samples. X0, then X1 would be, so maybe I should have started at 0, but uh, it doesn't really matter as long as we're consistent here. Okay, so now we have a another clever way of writing x. What happens when we throw this into the convolution equation? Well, we get that y of n is equal to, now we have our sum to deal with, xr n minus rn involved with h of n. Well, convolution is linear. We have distributive and associative properties. And so it becomes pretty straightforward to turn this into a sum over r of xr n minus rn involved with h of n. So in other words, we just convolve each of those chunks um, one at a time. And when we're all done, we have to add them back together. Well, what is it going to look like when we add them back together? So let's actually define this first as some R n minus R, or sum of y's, and where we've defined y n minus R. Actually, we can skip that part. Y n is equal to x R of n convolved with h of n. Okay, so now we can draw basically what this is going to look like. So for yn, we're going to get some signal coming out maybe like that. And let's label this y1 of n. y2 is going to be something maybe like that. And y2 of n. Now, it's shown shifted there. I just didn't add in the um, minus n and so on and so forth because I the way I've drawn it. So in essence, then, we need to sum these up. So we'll sum those where they overlap, and when we're all done, we will get y of n is equal to the sum of each of the individual convolution outputs. And um, 
yeah, that works. That's about it. We call this method the overlap add method. And the output is the sum of each of those blocks. There is another method called the overlap save method. What the overlap save method does is instead of having discrete blocks, it only uses the part of the signal that is, like in this case, that didn't have to be, whoops, that didn't have to be summed up. And then it uh, throws any that should be summed up away, and it uh, shifts the window a little bit and computes again so it can get another clear shot at that. The overlap add method is uh, almost universally, universally used. I think the textbook talks about the overlap save method for completeness. But um, this is the um, way that's used in uh, many uh, computer programs, especially if you're doing real-time processing. It's more efficient to process a block of data uh, on your computer than to do it just a single sample at a time. And so they process it in blocks and construct the output by doing overlap and add.